Thanks, Alex. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Great. Share my screen. Um, so yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, I'm going to take you through the modeling side of things uh, in my demo. So uh, what I'm going to do is put the COVID-19 simulation model, which is a model that was produced by Imperial College London. I'm going to take that model and, and put it onto Daphne and show you the steps that are involved within that. I won't go into too much technical detail in this talk, but if you go to our YouTube channel, I do go into more detail on some of those videos. Um, but we won't do that today, given the time. Um, so what we need to put a model on Daphne is essentially two things. We need what's known as a Docker image, which is essentially a way of packaging up code so that it runs in the same environment for you that it does for us. So with a Docker file, you, you tell it the operating system that you want to start from, you tell it all the packages that you want to install, uh, what kind of language that you're using to run the code, and then you copy all of your code into it, put it all into one big image and then send it off somewhere else and then it can be run in the same way. And so that's obviously better than us just taking a, a Python script or a R script or just some random code that you've written because we might have a completely different environment to you with different packages. We don't have all the things that you need, all the libraries you need to run your code. And so this is why we used uh, Docker to provide this nice sort of sanitized place to start running your model from. Uh, and this is an example of a Docker file on the screen at the minute. So I, again, won't to go into too much detail, but essentially this first line is always your base. So that's always the operating system that you want to build from. And here I'm just using a, a Debian operating system. I then grab some packages that I need to run my model. I clone the Git repository with this model in. Like I said, it's a Imperial College London model. So I clone that into the, the Docker image itself. Uh, and then I set up some directory structures, uh, basically compile the model and then run it at the end uh, and that's that's essentially it so this is this is a relatively complex docker file but it's actually relatively simple to put them together uh, there's plenty of information out there there's also plenty of um, base images that you can build from where they've done a lot of the hard work for you so if you're running a python model or an r model uh, you can essentially just google for docker file for uh, r or whatever and you'll find plenty of stuff available um, another reason we went with this approach was that it makes us languages not agnostic, like Brian was saying. So we can accept models in any kind of language. We've had models in Java, C Sharp, C++, C, Python, MATLAB, uh, you name it, and we've kind of done it already. Um, so if you can Dockerize it, we can run it essentially as the, the whole thing. Uh, the second file that you need is this definition file. And essentially this maps out some information about your model um, in terms of metadata, but also in terms of inputs. So this start block, this is defined in YAML and there's uh, lots of documentation available on our site, which describes this in more detail and how to put one of these together. And we've also got a, a GitHub page with lots of example models as well to follow along from, because if you're like me, you'll probably want to look at an example rather than a tutorial kind of thing. So this metadata block essentially outlines the stuff that you would expect. So stuff like a description, a title, um, some tags so that people can find it more easily. Uh, and then the second section down here is probably the most important bit because this defines what your model needs in order for it to be able to run. So this section that I've got here is called env and all of these uh, parameters get injected into the model as environment variables, which your model can then use as you would expect. Um, they also get exposed to the user when they come to run the model in a nice user-friendly way. And so we put things in like a description and a, a summary so that they can figure out what that parameter actually equates to uh, so that then you can make use of that in your model. We've got lots of different types of parameters. So obviously we've got a string one here and that I've put in some options. So I'll generate a drag, um, a drop down box on the front end. We can also support numerical values, floats and integers. We also support JSON as well uh, and some other types of parameters that you can read about in our documentation. Another type of input that this model doesn't actually take is uh, file-based input. So obviously you can imagine that uh, lots of models that we have require a CSV input or a JSON input to be able to actually run them. And so what you can do is you can add a section down here called data slots, and then you can pull information out of the catalog that Alex was just showing you into your model at runtime. And you can also make those data sets changeable by the user as well. So if you say have a model that runs against the census data from 
2011, you could then, once the new census information comes out, you could just swap that at runtime. Uh, so your model can be constantly update, up to date on Daphne with the latest data. Um, and the last section down here is the output section. And this just lists some of the files, well, all of the files that come out of this model. So that if you're coming to run this as a user, you have an idea of what you're expecting to actually come out of that. So now once we've got our Docker image and we've got our YAML file, our definition file, we can log into the site. Hopefully. Go home. Uh, so Alex is showing you the data section and I'm going to show you the models and the workflow sections now. So if we go into the model catalog, I'm logged in as a Daphne admin so I can see everything that everyone's uploaded. Um, so this, these are all the models that are available on Daphne. Some of them are private, some of them are public. A lot of the ones we had in the early days were uploaded by the Daphne team themselves. So we ran a series of pilot projects to sort of uh, grasp what the requirements of the system were and how we could make this process easier for users. Um, and what we've seen in more, more recent years is, well, most recent year, is that people have been actually able to upload their models themselves. So we're part of the Open Clim project and they're all able to upload their models themselves. Um, We've had people with the in the Nismo group uploading their own models, so we can kind of see that the system's working and it is easy enough for people to be able to upload their models. So that's really encouraging for us. And a lot of the models that you see here have been uh, uploaded by active users. Um, so how you actually upload a model is you go into this add model section. We then got extensive documentation about how to do all the things that I've just described. So writing your Docker file. Um, sorry, right on your definition file, producing a Docker file. We point to external documentation as well to help that process. Um, and we point to our GitHub repository with all of our examples. So that should be a nice user-friendly guide for people to be able to containerize their stuff and put it onto Daphne. But once we've read all that and done all those steps, we can tick that box, browse on our computer and find the image file, which is this, I've zipped it up just so that it's a quicker upload and our YAML file that we were just editing there. And then we just upload those. Um, we won't sit and wait for this because it does take a while, just because it's uh, about 100 meg. But once it's uploaded, we can search for it in the catalog. I could type. And then all of the metadata that you put in that YAML file is then displayed to the user on this page so they can navigate to their model. Obviously, when you first upload this, it'll be private just to you. But then as Alex has just shown, you could share this model within a group with other people, uh, or you could make it public on the platform so that anyone could use it. Um, so they can then browse to it here and explore what the different parameters do. They can see what kind of stuff comes out of the model and they can get an indication of whether it's something that's interesting to them. Um, so once I've got my model and I've uploaded it, I actually need to be able to run it. And the way that we run things on Daphne is using the workflow system. So this is kind of like the meat, if you like, of the modeling service, because it actually allows you to run things and to get some results out of it. So if we go across to create a workflow, and we'll just do, this is where we'd fill in some, some metadata where I won't bother too much for demo purposes. I go into my workflow creation. So this is where we can create an end-to-end -end workflow to, to run something and get some results. So the first thing we need to do is to add a step. We've got four different step types to choose from. First of which is an iterator step type, which will essentially iterate over the same model multiple times, but uh, changing a given parameter between a certain minimum and maximum value. So in that way, it allows you to do sensitivity analysis type runs where you would change a certain value. Um, the only iteration type that we've got at the minute is Monte Carlo, but we're expecting to add, add more in the future, obviously. And this whole iteration system is actually currently in the process of being overhauled to support things like uh, for loops and while loops and uh, much more complex types of iteration. So that's, that could be a really good value add for some modelers. The next uh, step type is uh, the model step types. This is probably the most important one because it's where we actually put the user uploaded model in. Uh, so we call this step COVID. Uh, we can then select the model from the catalog. So this is the same catalog that we were just using. Select that model. And then this parameters section down here gets populated with all of the things that the user can actually 
choose between. So I could change the country if I wanted to. Uh, I could change the R number, which we're all familiar with now. Um, how many people are complying and the case of like, uh, how long the government are recommending people to isolate for. There's actually a whole bunch more things that Imperial let you change, but I just did a few for demo purposes, essentially. Um, and I could change any of those between those minimum maximum values. And the section down here, which is empty, is if, if there were data sets that did go into this model, this would be populated and I could then choose from the data catalog which data set I want to load into that model. Um, but we don't have that in this case. Then if I, have, if I was building a system of systems workflow, I could add multiple model sets here. So let's say I was looking at how COVID is impacting the house, house market, for, for example, I could then add a housing model and feed the data that comes out of the COVID model into that housing model and then use that to get more accurate results. Obviously, you'd have to do some sort of transformation on the data that comes out so that your second model can read it okay. But in theory, that's that's exactly what people are doing. So with the NISMOD uh, people that we've been working with, they've got chains of a whole bunch of models that run end to end and it takes a few hours and then you get really nice results at the end. So. Uh, that's kind of the whole power of Daphne is that you can add these chains of workflows and collaborate with people and use other people's research to, uh, you know, make your own research a lot better. Uh, but we won't, add, we won't do that for now. We'll just keep it simple. So the last two steps are for getting data out of your model. So the simplest one of those is a publisher type model, uh, publisher type step, sorry. And that essentially takes all of the data that comes out of your model and then uploads it straight into the data catalog that Alex was showing you. Again, it'll be private just to you, but you can choose to then share that with other people. So if we were to do that, we'd fill, it, fill out this metadata form, which I won't go through because Alex has described that already. Um, and that would then just copy all that metadata into the catalog along with your data set. The second type is a visualization type. Um, so this allows you to create a visualization with your output data and then you know do some post-processing on that to, to see some results. The only visualization type we've got at the minute is Jupyter Notebooks, which I'm sure some of you will be familiar with, but if not, I'll show you what those are in a second. But unfortunately, Jupyter Notebooks still require the user to write some code to be able to actually do the post-processing and to you know, create these graphs. Um, what we're looking at at the minute is, and Brian mentioned this, is a drag and drop style interface for allowing people to do these visualizations so that they don't have to write the code. Because the whole point of this is that a non-technical user could do use the research done by someone else to produce these workflows and to do some visualizations. So we understand that's a, a limitation of the system as it stands. But if we were to add that step, we would again fill out some metadata just because the, the data still goes into the catalog um, and we would create that step. And then once we've got our workflow, it would look something like uh, this uh, end to end. So we've got a model step and a visualization step, and then we would execute that from this menu. Uh, and then it would take, I think the COVID model takes about two hours to run on Daphne. Uh, on my computer, I couldn't even run it for the UK because I didn't have enough memory. Um, I could only run it for Hawaii because it was such a small landmass. So that's, again, another benefit of Daphne is it allows you to, to use the compute that we've got to run models that you wouldn't even have a chance of running on your local machine. Um, but once that workflow is finished, I've got two ticks. I can head over to my visualization step and press visualize. And this then loads the Jupyter Notebook environment. And Jupyter Notebook, is, essentially, it's a way of writing code in the browser um, to do some post-processing on the results that come out of that. Uh, model. So all of my results are in this data folder, uh, but they're all in, you know, massive Excel files that are really difficult to read. So uh, the people at Imperial have uh, written this R script, which actually extracts the information from those Excel files. So if I run that, I should then get some graphs of whatever the, the model that I've just run is. Obviously, you'd have to change the script to, to fit with your model, but this is sort of the basic premise of a Jupyter notebook is that you can do some exploration of the data at the end. Um, and as I say, we're currently working on providing this drag and drop interface as an alternative to this for uh, less technical users. Um, and that was, that was it from me. So I'll stop sharing.
but happy to answer any questions.